So my focus is on the relationship between cultural forms, politics, and modes of resistance. And of course, it's a relationship which is rarely direct or even explicit. Gerard Roenig, in a book called Art and Revolution, describes art and revolution as neighbouring zones, which I think is quite a nice way of thinking about it. Neighbouring zones with temporary overlaps. Not to incorporate one another, but rather to enter into a concrete exchange relationship for a limited time. Transitions, overlaps and concatenations of art and revolution become possible for a limited time, but without synthesis and identification. It's this exchange, then, which is my focus. And it may well be that those cultural forms which have an influence upon or form a context for resistances are very often not contemporary. For instance, Abu al-Qasim Ishabi is, was sorry, a Tunisian poet, and he's been called the poet of the Arab Spring. So I looked him up. Yet his most cited and recited poem on the streets, The Will of Life, was written by a man who died in 1934. And his poetry is not just recited on the streets in Tunisia, but also Egypt and elsewhere. <clears throat> and the poem starts like this. If one day a people desire to live, then fate will answer their call. And then their night will begin to fade and their chains to break and fall. For he was embraced by a passion for life will dissipate into thin air. At least that is what all creation has told me and what its hidden spirits declare. <clears throat> Another poem of his, To the Tyrants of the World, was also used. And in the Egyptian context, the poetry of Ahmed Fouad Negem, now 83 years old, and at one time spent 18 years in prison in Egypt. Some of his poems were chanted in Tahrir Square. And those poems of his which were set to music by Sheikh Imam were sung by protesters. The translation always makes these sound rather banal, so excuse me. The brave men are brave. The cowards are cowardly. Come with the brave together to the square. If there are not many substantial literary works published as yet about the Arab Spring, many well-known writers in Egypt, Syria, Tunisia and Libya have written about and actively participated in the events. Against a background of censorship, prohibition, imprisonment, exile, all or most of the writers I shall be referring to had, and had to varying degrees, written about corruption, cronyism, detention, torture, financial scandals, poverty, unemployment, sexual repression in the regimes in which they live. And these works, became a context, if not a prediction, in which the protests were articulated. I pause to say, if not a prediction, because some canny or opportunistic publishers have been producing books, not this one, written, say, 2008, 2007, 2006, saying, the book that predicted the Arab Spring. Um, there's loads of those out, well, not loads, but many. Um, so I'm not talking about prediction, I'm talking about context. Conjuncture, what they used to say in Birmingham many, many years ago. So interestingly enough, many of the writers have spoken about the difficulty of writing fiction during the uprisings. Some of the writers I met when I went to um, so something called Free Word in London in March, writers from Syria and elsewhere, talked about the difficulty of writing during the uprisings, or of writing fiction, and of the need to participate actively in the uprisings by other means. The Syrian poet in exile, Hala Muhammad, said that the cry, the Syrian people would not be humiliated, is the most beautiful poem written this year. 